hello and welcome to another episode of the Robertson Stash. I'm Matt Robertson. I'm here with Sean. You guys know him by now, I'm sure. Guys. And today we have a very special guest, Brian Dosher. Oh yeah. <laughs> AKA the Renaissance Warrior. Wow, yeah, yeah. 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 We've known each other for quite a long time now. Yeah, absolutely. It's wow. good to see you. It's you, really good to be here. You too. It's you're yeah. a hard guy to get a hold of <laughs> these days. You right? got rid of your cell phone service. I did. Yeah, yeah. It's been actually a couple of months now. Yeah. And I've been off social media for a year, so I'm wow. just. Wow. Uh, does that feel liberating? And it like really freeing? does. It's been so insightful. I mean, I, I've been really drawing on self reliance. I I listened to uh, Henry David Thoreau's Walden Pond, and then he was inspired by Ralph Waldo Emerson's uh, self reliance. And okay. it's, it's been a direction that I've always kind of leaned on my whole life and giving up the cell phone and, uh, and letting go of the social media. I've really like leaned into it. Yeah. They're sure. not, the government's not spying on you as much anymore. Yeah. yeah. It's pretty crazy. I mean, those phones are incredibly useful. They do a lot of things. They're, they're incredibly powerful tools, but that it's changed. Like I've been doing a lot of camping and it was, it became heavy to me. Like I noticed the encumbrance of the object, you know, like uh, when trying to move around, work on my bug or, or, you know, maneuver around my kayak or whatever. I just noticed that it was like constantly in the way really? where I've, I've now I stash it because even without the cell phone service, it has an incredible GPS feature. So I can like pull up maps yeah. uh, even offline. And where I was at backpacking, I was well outside of cell phone range or whatever, but, and it still comes in handy. Plus I can download my podcasts. Uh, and <laughs> music, movies, and everything like that. So it's an incredible entertainment device, but I just noticed that uh, I've just like separated myself from it a little bit. Uh, and everyone these days becomes so, they rely upon their cell phone so much for directions, for anything. Like, yeah. So mm. they kind of be able to do it without a cell phone out in the woods. And, and we do rely on it and it's amazing like having a calculator or you know the dictionary in your pocket or whatever. But uh, it's like now when I travel somewhere, I'm, I'm going back to, and I grew up in this era before cell phones or whatever, where I'm like looking at a map and, and honestly like remembering the handful of roads and the turns that I have to take. And landmarks. Yeah. Turn to turn. Yeah. And kind of setting a little, and, and utilizing your brain to like kind of, you know, set like a little memory for where you're going and, and access that. And so it's just where everything's been programmed. We just got back from Cancun and you couldn't go anywhere in the resort without your app. Oh, wow. To for, unlock for, doors and stuff? No, yeah. like when you get to a restaurant, they expect you to look at your app for the menu. Oh, yeah. And so we were sitting right. down, we were sitting down right. at the lobster house and, and she's like, are you guys ready to order? I'm like, oh, shit. Like, I don't even Got have the phone. app. So Alex pulls it out and we look and, you know, and then you have to, everything's on the app. So if we get hit by a direct solar f flare and everyone's cell phones right. go down. Cancun's out. Cancun's <laughs> out. No lobster house for you. Right. Well, and people like you that you have this nomadic lifestyle, you're kind of, uh, you know, on the road a lot. I mean, you might be OK. You know which way north is and you could probably start a fire without your cell phone. I, and well, and I'm cultivating those skills, you know, and and, uh, and I'm really like devoting a serious amount of time every day to reevaluating the way I want to live and, and, and cultivating, like I was saying, those, those skills and techniques or whatnot. And, and I feel like these phones can be a huge handicap. I mean, a lot of things are become smarter. You know, you, you can order a thing. It talks to your fridge that tells your microwave how to cook it uh, yeah. or whatever. You You're know? out of eggs. Right. Order eggs. And, and we're and like recently I, I've started baking bread. And, and so I've been camping and baking bread out camping and it oh, is nice. phenomenal. Like there's a reason it's in the Bible and it's like the staff of life or whatever, you know, really? it's, it's amazing that you're familiar can with that part of the Bible take. Well, and you know, they mention it a lot or I, but it, it's, it's a powder, you know, that you can mix with this yeast and bring it to life, you know, your grains or whatever. And, and then it rises. It's like active. You, there's a certain amount 
amount of time that you're interacting with it or whatever before it's ready to bake. And then you can literally bake this like on a, on a fire. Like I baked a uh, loaf just straight up on the ash or whatnot, inspired by Henry David Thoreau when he was uh, doing Walden Pond and building his own house. Um, but, and it's funny cause I'm at the grocery store and I'm telling people like, oh, I'm baking bread. And they're like, oh, that's so hard and difficult and da da da. And, and it's throw it on the fire. <laughs> right. Well, and it's almost like a trope that people are just like, they haven't even tried it themselves. They have no uh, experience, hands on experience. They're just like, oh, that's too difficult or whatnot. And, and I found, you know, that YouTube, it's, which is an amazing tool. I found this guy in Ohio is like high on life, all super excited about making bread or whatnot. And he had this particular technique of making it in a plastic bag. So you don't even get your hands dirty. You just you like make it in a Ziploc bag out in the woods. Hmm. Like you, you have your ingredients pre, uh, uh, proportioned out. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then you just throw in your water, you know, and, and the whole thing happens in the bag and then you can pull it out and make like dumplings or like you can twist it up on a stick or you make a whole loaf or whatever, mm. which it over the fire. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a, uh, it's like an Australian technique also too, where they, you burn your fire down to like white ash and then you drop the, uh, the, uh, round right on the fire and much like cooking a pizza in a wood fire oven, it almost extinguishes the ashes that it's sitting directly on top of. So it doesn't over scar the bottom of the, uh, the, uh, the round or whatnot. And you might have to pick it up and rotate it a little and tend Sorry, it. are all our cell phones off here? I didn't bring not one. anymore. Yeah, you don't have one. <laughs> and the pro that, here has yeah, his own thing. Got a okay. in the mix. Go Running ahead, on sorry. with this. Oh, but it's just it was so enlightening to make bread. Like it's just been it's like empowering or whatever. And I feel like it's like when I go into a grocery store now and you see all these baked items, you realize that they're essentially like four ingredients with a couple of like additives, a little bit of. Then you slice the top with a razor blade or something. Or yeah, you, you can. can. That's one technique. There's so many techniques. Uh, yeah. I'm gonna try it. I've never baked bread before. It is, oh, it is like enlightening and delightful. I, I have two buns rising right now. I, I was hoping that they were gonna be ready to, I was gonna ba speed bake one and bring it over, but I it would have been that a, stuff, it, dude. that's well, the, it, the tech, yeah. Rise. Last I was seeing of you, when you used to have Instagram, you were roaming around the countryside with your trailer, living this nomadic lifestyle. And I found that very interesting. You would kind of document your your problems, your, your yeah. you know, uh, how to fix them. So what are you doing now? And tell, are you still living the life on the road? I am. Yeah. And you know, it's really interesting. Like, uh, I, Instagram was evolving and, and I'll tell you, even in the beginning, like when the stories broke out, I can remember, I think I was in Philly and I was like, God damn, does this mean I got to show people like when I brush my teeth and what kind of jam <laughs> I put on my fucking toast and everything like that. You know, it's just like where our lives were like even more exposed at this point and we're becoming these like public figures and, and, and I was a little shy about that. Like I definitely was not excited about getting behind the camera and like showing people my face. But mm -hmm. at the same time I was reflecting cause I too was like watching certain people's Instagrams or whatnot. Some of them were really enlightening to see these people like there presenting themselves, you know, kind of this, uh, like behind the vulnerable camera, vulnerable side of them, a vulnerable side of them. Yeah. Abs absolutely. And even showing like a daily, uh, progress or like a, a daily, um, like a journal or whatever, you know? Um, and, and, and it's funny cause there was a progress. We talked about this a little bit of me get, like getting behind the camera. Cause I did a little bit of theater when I was, yeah, you mentioned that before. I wanted to talk yeah. to you about that. Yeah. So you, did you go to school for theater? No, no, I or did. Uh, we had this like Missoula children's theater that came through Sandpoint, uh, Idaho, where I grew up. Okay. And the, it was brilliant because it was uh, co-ed and it was like all ages. Um, and I can, I remember specifically, we'd get in a big circle around the auditorium and you would like present yourself, you know, and then they, and it would like a round robin, just go all the way around. And there were people that were like my parents' age that were also part of the uh, pr uh, presentation or whatever that um, would uh, audition. So you guys would like uh, do a play together yeah. or something? What's where some that you've been into? Uh, my big my big role was uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, and I I was one of the for her forest friends, uh, Fernando the Frog. Oh, cool! Where, where I had to have full makeup. It was terrible. It was like green. It was an ugly costume. But I had this uh, one line where I would, you know, we were looking for a prince or whatever, and then I would go center stage and address the whole audience, you know, and be like, "Kiss me, somebody, kiss me," <laughs> you know. And and I had a, a huge amount of lines, and it was 
was really, I mean, it was a brilliant experience to uh, memorize and then to work with all these other people and drop your lines, you know, when uh, when you were on cue or whatever. And so is this before you got into glass blowing? You Absolutely. Were, yeah. Okay. This is when I was like a really young kid. So okay. then, you know, high school happened and uh, puberty and all these things. And, and I remember I had a speech class and I was terrified to get up in front of my peers and talk, you know, it was, it was like complete flip, like totally nervous, uh, stutter, you know, just couldn't, didn't know how to hold myself or whatever. Uh, and then, you know, and then I got into glass and I was like in a shed for a long time, like not even only talking to a handful of people yeah. <laughs> and then <laughs> social, social media hit. And all of a sudden there's this opportunity to get behind the camera again. And I already had this big following and, you know, a lot of people knew who I was or whatever, but it was like nerve wracking to kind of, or to be so vulnerable behind the camera. I was like struggling with that because I'm like emotional and honest. And, you seem quite natural at it from what I remember. Right. So it was uh, very informative. So there was a point where it got, it was really exciting. Like when, when I kind of like created, like created the character and then got behind the camera, it gave me energy. Like I can remember doing those daily talks and I would be struggling with something on the trailer and then I'd step into my like uh, Han Solo, Millennium Falcon, you know, kind of mode and then pull the camera out and talk about what I was getting over, you know, some kind of problem with the, the warp drive or whatever. Yeah. And, and it was, it was fun and I could tell it, it did, give it fed me uh like on in a creative way but then it was crazy man i hit this point when i think i was also struggling a lot because you you saw that i was like trouble this one problem with the trailer another problem with one the trailer thing, yeah. and it Fix felt one thing another thing breaks and it was like this wave that kind of like like crashed over me and then all of a sudden i just it's and, and I read uh, walden pond and spent a lot of time in the woods but i just like backed off of social media and i kind of that's where i am now i guess mm. So, so yeah, it's interesting. Very cool. So how did you get into glass? I think people want to <laughs> hear that story. Yeah. Did, um, did you have an apprentice or did you? No, you know, it's, it's a magical story, uh, really. And, and what a magical time to be involved in glass, you know, with the evolution of, of the marijuana industry, uh, you know, and just the evolution of these heady pipes or whatever. Technology like we used to make them. Yeah. The torches, the colors. Absolutely. It's all blown up in the last 30 years. Yeah. Like of any medium that you could have gotten into. I mean, you I know, agree. Yeah. yeah. Of every medium, if you had a scale, like glass is off the charts in the last 30 years. Everything else would kind of just gradually go up. Ceramics, paint, yep, yep. glass, last 30, 40 years with scientific glass and the colors. Yeah. Like it, it's off the charts it, and the community too. The, the fact that a lot of us are these renegades, self made, like alternative counterculture, you know, a lot of us like kind of like spent some time maybe in the, in the scene, but then we broke out and are self-made, you know, and then, and then we totally. all found each other. So it's this, uh, incredible community of, of, uh, free thinking, creative, um, you know, radical individuals that mm -hmm. I, it's yeah, the, the, the best people, like the people that I want to be surrounded. We're with pretty blessed to be a part of it. Yeah. So it, it's amazing to find myself here, but it, it back in uh, college, well, I, I went to high school or whatever. And, and even so, if you want to take it all the way back to there, my, I got into high school, I'm pumped to take this art class. Mr. Anderson is this incredible artist that's just past his prime and he's just too old to be teaching anymore. And, and I just, I, I had a, a miserable, miserable time and got like D's or whatever, you know, and really, yeah. And it kind of, and I was like at this point too, and I, I also struggled, I had a learning disability. I couldn't spell for shit, still can't, you know, so I was just sort of like, like, I remember my sophomore year, I was like, fuck, I don't even know what I'm going to do, you know? And, and then this, and it's really incredible how uh, one individual can have such a huge impact on your life. But this new art teacher came in, Dan Shook, and he just, he's shook he, things up. Dude, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's I've never heard it like that, but that's it. He did, a hundred percent. Like we went from just like this, like pitiful art class that only had like drawing and and no supplies or whatever to like uh, oils and 
ceramics was a big thing. He brought an entire ceramic department and everything this man touched was like alive. Like he made a sculpture of a woman and it was like, just, it, it was like, it had a glow, like a wow. energy to it, you know? And, and he, we listened to like the Beatles and Led Zeppelin and, and crash test dummies. And we was had this midway through the team. year. Yeah. Oh, so it was like, okay. It, wow. on, it was my junior year. So it just like, all of a sudden I was like, holy shit. I didn't even know. I grew up in this small town in Idaho. I didn't even know these mediums were like available. Like, or, wow. you know, I mean, he had marble. I remember I took the marble block out and I hammered on it and I was just at a complete loss. <laughs> it's like, I mean, <laughs> no one so came cool. out to love me, but I was just like, I've, but he had the stuff, you know, I at least got to go out there and bang on the thing. I mean, we were taking pieces of paper. It's funny because fire comes into play. And, and cutting pieces of tape and doing relief, almost like a sandblasting. But instead of sandblasting, we were using spray cans and lighting them and, and flash burning the paper. Oh, wow. And then peeling the, the stuff off to reveal these images. I mean, it- That's and he, pretty cool. Yeah, and he was like down, you know? He was like, whatever you guys are doing, just don't burn the school down. You know? For the sake of art. <laughs> For the yeah. sake of art. Yeah. So is that when you got into glass, did they have a little torch so set up? That, that's when art, I was like, okay, it's game on, yeah, it's back on. Like I, I realized that art is far beyond any one particular medium. It's like the mini, it's like, it can be a life experience. It, it could be the theater or presentation or, you know. A, a Great way to express yourself. Yeah, so that, and then college, uh, well, and then the, you know, summer after high school happened and I was just like, woo. And a bunch of my buddies who now are like Vala Victorian and summa cum laude, and doctors and principals, they were all going to college. And I was like, where, you know, where are you guys going? Like hopped on last minute, exhausted the, the college of all the art programs, you know, did ceramics for six or seven years, uh, you know, nice. sculpting, uh, welding, brazing, um, mixed media, uh, textile design, uh, you know, so I got, it was exciting to. But this is were, in high school. College. Oh, college. Okay. Yeah. But no, no glass blowing. Mm. Didn't even, I'd never even seen glass blowing at the mall. I didn't even no know. No existed. <laughs> yeah. You could like melt glass and make things out of it besides bottles or oh, cool. you know, plates and shit like that. <laughs> so I exhausted the art program and then I withdrew from college. Um, and I was just, I was hanging out in this house with no direction really. I was bending wire, making these little figurines. And, uh, this, <laughs> this art, this, uh, this glass blower, Heath Anspeck, shows up in a blue Econoline van. It's like, uh, like yeah, I love Ford Econolines. <laughs> yeah, 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 they're sweet. Knocks on our door and he's like, "Yo, I noticed you guys got this shed in back. We had this like crash pad party house, you know, that been uh, that way for many years, many generations." And so, and he was a local, so he just he knew that you know whatever. And so he he knocked at the door, cold, total cold call. I didn't know any of us. And he sets up, he could blow glass in his van, so he blew glass right no there. Way. And, and, the, and I still have my piece. The first thing I made was in that van with like the two dogs next to me, like four <laughs> friends. He had like a, you slid open the door and there was a fan that hung there. And he had an oven overhang fan and a, and a hand torch. And, and I made this like meteorite looking thing. I, mean, I remember coming there with the stringer and being like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh is this, what's going on? Happened, yeah. I don't even know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, that's it, a pretty cool first experience. Oh my gosh. Right. Yeah. And I mean, I didn't see anything. I was searching for a medium. Like I knew I love ceramics, but I needed, I didn't have any equipment. So I was going to have to, you know, like resurrect myself from scratch with that. And then this guy set up in, in our shed and I just started hanging out with him, um, watching him. And then he took off to Oregon to Lincoln city. And I drove out with him. My van broke down on the way, maxed out a credit card to put a new engine in it. Spent that summer blowing glass with him out in the woods, you know, like wow. on K tanks, built my own little shop, <clears throat> set up in this barn, had the little uh, national hand torch strapped to the bench wow. or whatever. And we were making spoons and, and he, his tech was to make them a little longer mm. than a regular one. You know, the old school, you know, it cools the smoke down a little bit more, you know, mm -hmm. but, but that's how we would sell them, you know, and then his tech was, we would take like 16 heavy and draw stringers on it and then take seven mil and goop that seven mil over the stringers. Okay. Not, not raking So they're them. raised. 
their rays. Yeah. So it was like a fake inside out. Oh. Or we and then melted in. And and then, yeah. So some... the, the 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 stringers were like trapped in the matrix. But like, so yeah. then you fume back then too. Yeah, yeah. We also okay. did some fuming. Cool. Because I brought these in today. This oh one's my god! Really heavy. Look at that. Ah. But I wanted to Is this explain for real? to people that don't really know about the fuming. Like, here's the piece we made last week. Damn. And look at all the rainbow of colors that you've made. And so you've just made them with gold and silver fume, right? Yeah. yeah. So how, ex, can you explain to us how you do that? Which is also, ta I got it tattooed here. This is the alchemist symbol for gold, which is the sun okay. and the moon, which represents silver. Nice. And, and it, this, so yeah, this technique was taught to me all the way back then. And, and it, and it blew my mind that you could take this bit of silver and gold. And I'd worked with all these mediums before. So I was like, like sticking the little bit of metal into the flame and having it vaporize was like spray paint or airbrush to a degree. And then it collects on the, uh, the blank or whatever, like on a, on a molecular like level, a very, you're trying to get this like very thin, even application and silver you, 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 it'll just, you want to whisper silver at the piece. Like, yeah, and you touch silver, whisper, whisper. You touch silver to the flame and you know, it's just boom, you got a silver cloud. Like, it, you know, exploding. that's what happens. Yeah. I'm not really familiar with too much fuming, but so oh. you take a little piece of silver, you cut like a little edge off, right? Put it in a glass rod and then put it in the flame and then it turns the flame green or whatever, right? Or, right. So you'll you have kind of just fume. Exactly. Onto a tube or something. So you'll bring your flame down to a very specific neutral with silver, but then a little, uh, you'll give it just a little more fuel. So you'll see at the end of the candles will be like a little bit of yellow, but we're talking the teeny tiniest little flame. And then you'll have just what you said, a tiny little nugget. And we're talking tiny, like uh, smaller than a BB, bigger than a grain of sand but like tiny little nugget of silver on the end of your glass rod. Mm -hmm. And then you'll touch that to the end of the, the flame tips. And then those will vaporize that metal, not the entire bit of it, but a little bit. And it'll cast a cloud out over the, it, you know, uh, it'll head out in the direction the flames kind of blasting it. And then you'll have your blank there and you'll collect a very thin like layer only a like molecularly like or whatever like very very thin amount of silver on the blank so it just like sprays the sheen over the glass totally wow it's, how do you get the different colors then so silver if you whisper the silver at it you'll get this electric light blue but if you step over that and it like i said silver just wants to like wash out <clears throat> it'll turn white uh, and then there's like a ugly piss yellow that happens right before that or why not, but you can do tricks with that too. Like Adam G does some crazy stuff with over heavy silver fuming. Um, but for my, my technique in particular, I'll whisper that silver and onto that real thin layer, it, it creates this amazing blue that's both reflective and translucent, uh, and then this gold, which you can just hose out and you tighten that flame up a little bit. So instead of the, you, you pull that um, fuel back so there's not that yellow on the tips. It's a little hissy, a little bit of uh, oxygen. And then that'll hose out your gold and you can just layer that on. And Over it, the whole piece? So well, would you do stripes of silver? I, I uh, fume the whole piece with silver. Okay. So I've got this like blue undercoat sheen and then I'll hose the gold in particular areas. So that'll create, the gold comes out like a yellow pink. So then overlay to the blue, you get a green. Mm -hmm. And then if I leave blue, I'll get the blue, green, yellow kind of uh, rainbow, which can, it's a tricky. So mm. is gold easier to work with than silver? Cause it's a little, it's, is it a little softer? Almost. It's with gold, you can't get too much, but it's harder to get that flame to get it out there. Mm. Like silver, you touch it to any flame, it's like, woo, it's out. And that's, and it, it's hard to get that flame that's soft enough because the silver just wants to like go. But with the gold, it's like tricky to, to uh, excite it off the punny, but then once it, once, then you can just coat the piece with it. So fuming is literally the tech of taking a metal and turning it into fume, a solid into fume, gas. Gas. Are there other metals you can do this with, like copper or like? All the other metals create a really ugly white 
color and gold. And although I think you can use, and Steve Bates would be a good one to ask on this, I think you can use like a copper or nickel, but they're highly toxic, the gas. And the gold and silver are pretty toxic too, but they're gold's inert. Uh, and you know, we, we have a, we hold our breath and just kind of say a little prayer <laughs> and you know, there's people like Bob that have been s blowing silver on glass forever. A little bit he of heavy metal is good for you, dude. Yeah. You Probably. Know, Bob, every time I see Bob, so he looks great. Do you use like so. 24 carat or is you want to get like the most pure you can get or is there? You do want to use the most pure. I'd like to smoke that too. Oh yeah. Yeah. But there's also some really cool tricks. So if you use impure gold, like say gold that you harvested from the earth or was like 22 or 23, I think it has nickel or something in it. And when you first fume, so if you fume gold directly on the surface and then cool it down, you can wipe it right off. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you use the impure golds, there's something about that nickel that's in it that helps it adhere to the surface and kind of lock it in or mm. whatnot, but when you fume with an impure gold, the first couple of times you fume, you burn all the impurities out of it, and you're, then you're left, you refine it down to like pure gold. So it's kind of, so, yeah. So you want to encase that after you put it on, right? You, you yes. don't want, you can't just leave it exposed on the surface. Yes, yeah, exactly. So what do you, how do you encase it? Um, so there's many different techniques. I mean, a lot, uh, a real common technique that makes a really cool little, uh, Marble is just you blow a bubble, you fume the gold and silver, and then you just uh, take another clear rod, melt it, and you put dots, and you'll just trap each dot traps a little bit of the gold and silver. Uh, but with my technique, what I'll do is I, I wrap a stringer around the clear blank, and then I'll fume the gold and silver, and then I take a clear rod and I draw rakes into it. So I'm heating up the surface just enough that I'm not, it's so, it's such a finite technique that I, I'm not burning off any of the metals and, but I'm getting the surface hot enough to uh, accept the melted glass. And it's, it's so hot that it's actually drawing a chevron into the stringer, pulling like a V into it or whatnot. So it, and, and that's wow. something I love about the, the cut and flip technique in particular is it's utilizing the gold and silver fuming, which I, I find I'm constantly intrigued. Like each time you fume, it's, it's slightly different. Each one's unique and individual. And then you do the stringer wrap, which is an ancient technique all the way back to, to the Egyptians. Yeah. I've seen little bottles with the right. wrap and rake technique on them from right. and then a few thousand years ago. Right. Yeah. That's crazy. When I, when I saw those, you know, I knew they existed, but when I saw them, uh, in the corny museum, I was just it's awestruck. So, yeah. Yeah. You That's really, you're just like, too. damn man, like thousands of years people have been, you know, They're like how did they get a dress. torch that hot right. with like a bellow? Maybe they, they, they built and... a fire in a cone with, and then the chimney underneath. So it was like a wood fire pizza oven, but the top was like a cone. And they had this raging fire and then out the chimney top. That was, was the hottest. They, yeah, oh, really? they blew the glass right there. Wow. And I think they also used uh, either bellows or they set up in an area where the wind was always blowing. So Ooh. it could push the air in. To, with a, they had like an intake for the. Like the texture on this thing is crazy. It looks like little jewels in between all the lines. Yeah. And that's many sections too. So there's like. You know, there's a section here, a section here, a mm -hmm. section there. But like together. on the top of his back is just seriously like little jewels that are stacked next to each other that you can see like the roundness of them. It's crazy. The the metals have that reflective translucent uh, uh, effect. And then when I drew those rakes down, uh, it was on a really thin blank. And then when I cut it and flipped it around and melted it, it creates that 3D inside out. And, and you actually see those lines melted in. So it pushed the metal up mm -hmm. and it has that reflective like. His nose and mouth just look insane. You did an amazing job with the sculpting on it. Well, I and had some beautiful prep to work with, that's for sure. Your, your proportions are just incredible uh, and the detail that's in the head the in the facial features like the mouth and the lips and the ears and and but it's still like functional like you can hold on to it like the bottom the legs are stubby 
it's very easy to hold on to, set down, yeah. pick up, or whatnot. But then you've got all that detail up there. It's just thank incredible. you. So is this going to be part of the final one hundred? I think collabs are going to be okay. Just okay. the last <laughs> one hundred solos. Yeah. Okay. So you, you specialize in the cut and flips. I've also seen you make these really cool, like little medieval time. Trebuchet, what are they called? Trebuchets. Trebuchets. Yeah, yeah. trebuchet or whatever. Trebuchet. French word, yeah. Those are really cool. Are you still making those? Uh, you know, it's been a minute. And I'll tell you, with those, that was a pure uh, endeavor, like a pure artistic endeavor and challenge. They were functional, though. I saw yes. people flipping dabs into their bangers from across the room. They would set it off and it would go right in. Which was incredible because that was really tricky. And I'd made one and I shot this one video where I was shooting a tiny piece of uh, Illuminati and I had the black light on and I, and it, it hit the banger and bounced and bounced out like a basketball that, oh. you know, you, oh, you were like, oh, it's a three pointer. It's in. And it wasn't, uh. but I feel like that kind of lit a spark. And then these incredible, uh, dab kids that had all the, uh, energy, time, persistence and dedication made it happen. Yeah. Shot some incredible cool. abracadabra has made some amazing videos with lighting and slow-mo, you know, where he's been able to, hit nice. like perfect dunks <laughs> we'll to check those out that was a neat collaboration no that uh so I, I was intrigued with glass because it's like uh you know fragile but it's an incredibly strong medium and, and it has some amazing uh, uh um aspects of it or whatnot and and mm -hmm. i've been intrigued with articulation and i was drawn to physics uh and i love medieval culture so it really uh ev everything uh came together with the with those trebuchets. Yeah, were, were they any of them functional, like for smoking out of? I made a few that way, because I felt like in the beginning, being this pipe glass artist, it was like, why well, you gotta make some kind of functionality <laughs> to it. But then I, I came to this epiphany where I was like, the function is really what it does, launching yeah. an object or whatever. And and That's I took, and I omitted the uh, pipe and and that to me, they, they sung the, strongest or whatever when they were yeah. just a glass trebuchet that's and, pretty cool and i made them just a pure love out of just the desire which i think every artist should allocate a certain amount of time to those kind of uh, experiences i mean for yourself just for, for no yourself. one else yeah. yeah henry david thoreau says that trade curses everything it handles and though you may trade in messages from heaven the whole curse of trade attaches to the business you know, that's going to set in for me, but I want to read this guy, <laughs> dude, because he, you keep talking about him. Oh, it, yeah, it had a great. huge impact on me. But uh, no, and, and trade, um, you know, and the hustle, it, I mean, it, it definitely inspires a lot of things or whatever, but it's good to take a time out and just maybe do a little bit of sketching. Uh, just, you know, some people maybe just go dance or whatever it is, you know, that's yeah. not involved with your the your business or you whatever. get caught up in this grind you know you yeah. wake up you get into this routine it's good to switch it up do I'm, yeah. I'm in that mode right now just to try to do some new stuff like this podcast actually yeah yeah which is brilliant it, you know this reminds me i can remember way back when i first started blowing glass in the 90s i had the opportunity to meet bob and walk into his studio and when I walked into his studio, I'll never forget, because I was all hungry for glass, you know? Just like new techniques. Wow, what year was this, like late 90s? Or? Late 90s, yeah. yeah. And and I was just, and more complex, you know? I was just like, what what can we do that's like, what are the secrets that are like even, like I remember I did see a piece of his and it had pushed mushrooms that had been smashed and then assembled into the can of a sidecar you know, so uh -huh. now they were it's part like, of the wall. Like they were, they were thinned down all yeah. the way to the wall thickness. Wow. And, I, and I remember thinking That's like, cool. how did he push a, and take a marble and smush it and then stick a whole bunch together? Like it was, it was beyond me. I was, you know, it was like, it was complicated to think about. But I remember when I walked in the studio and at this point, I mean, shit, he'd been blowing glass for like what, 30 years or something like that, 40 wow. years, I don't know. But uh, he, he just had a, a handle and he heated it up and he just stuck it to a piece of broken glass. And then he melted that and blew it out into a bubble. And wow. then he just stuck that to another piece. Of, and I remember being like. Like little shards? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really? He was just picking up shards and melting them down and blowing them out into bubbles. And I remember being like. That's so cool. What's going on? Is this some kind of, is he fucking with me? I was <laughs> like, you know, I didn't. But now that I look back, I'm like, he was just having fun. 
He was just melting glass and fun. And, yeah, and how it probably the, looked cool too. Like you could maybe you could see some yeah. pieces of the puzzle. And the, it totally, it's something I never even thought about, you know, that you could do something like that. Like mm-hmm. it was so out of my wheelhouse of just being like melting blobs of glass and out into bubbles or whatever, you know? Yeah. But it, and, and I didn't even realize the value of it until much later in my career, you wow. know, where I was like, damn, he was just fucking around. And then how incredible that can be to like, you know, cause you have your techniques and you know that it's very precise. You got to do these steps in a very specific way to get your, your outcome. It's almost like the more mainstream glass is becoming, the less people kind of like see that having fun part of it, like stepping right. back. It's all about the money. Oh, what's the next hype right. dab device we can make? Right, right. Uh, there's been some other things too, just growing up in North Idaho or whatever, which is like, anti-weed and, and also like trying to thrive in a market outside of ours to a degree. Um, I've thought about some other objects to make and like I've made little glass magnifiers. Um, I've made really, yeah. Like, you know, just like a traditional handle with the ball on the yeah. end. And I'll even do, I, I do these ones where I'll put three different balls and I kind of mush them together. Oh, so it looks cool. like an alien magnifier. That's awesome. Wow. Does it work like that? Too? Uh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Where you got like you a hyper a magnifier and you could light a bowl. Or, mm-hmm. you know, just look at fine print, uh, you know, <laughs> read, the, either, read the Bible, read the Bible. Yeah. Or uh, I've made uh, one of my favorite things I've made is a glass, uh, a rattle for kids, mm-hmm. you know, like when you have a new child and I'm totally into it because for sure they're fragile and it's more like a, it, they are functional, they rattle, but it's more the thing that you could get a gift at your birth that you could potentially have like your entire spoon. life. Sometimes they'll yeah. give spoons to the babies. And yeah, yeah. And it's incredible spoon. that you had a gift that was given to you at that age that you could potentially, you know, 50 years later or whatever, still have. Yeah. You know, and it's, yeah. Piece of art. Very cool. Okay, well, dude, we talked about glass. We talked about your travel life and... So are you kind of like settling down now? You're not so much on the road. Are you trying to find the perfect spot Man. to settle down? Found a, find a mountain babe. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm committed to my lifestyle, which has definitely just been, uh, I'm, you know, it, it, whatever. It's just made it that I'm mostly single and spend a great deal of time alone, which I'm very comfortable with. And I think, uh, it's important for everybody to invest some time to, into having no distractions, or whatever, and just spending a, a lot of time with yourself. To a like, lot of people can't handle that. They right. need distractions. Yeah, like the whole last year, I was out in the woods uh, alone, wow. backpacking, uh, taking like uh, five day trips, kayaking with all my gear and dry bags, baking the bread, watching the moon rise on a you know lake all by myself, and um, and it's been really enlightening. I would say, God, it was like. Well over a year ago, I ran into some hiccups with the trailer. Mm -hmm. It was kind of in the beginning of COVID or whatnot. So that that made my lifestyle became a little more complicated. Not impossible. You know, there's still truckers that were out there on the road and there were still resources for us. Uh, But it it did become a lot more like dump stations shut down across the country, you know, and whatever. Mm. But uh, I ran into a couple of hiccups. I... I, um, had I took the trailer in to get worked on and had some bad business interactions and then my transmission blew on the truck. Mm. And, and these are things that are just gonna happen in my lifestyle, but they did hit me and I feel like, like I stumbled and I've just been like tr- uh, struggling to kind of get my footing like since then. And it's been interesting because like a lot of, t- you know, a whole year has passed and whatnot, but I did spend a lot of time in the woods just kind of um, regrouping or whatnot uh but then it like life kind of threw me some curveballs and i found myself in this radical traveling again um i just flew to florida without a cell phone which was really awesome you know and like spent like a month there without any real plans uh and now i'm here uh just kind of like sleeping on on a, a mat on the floor in the shop and living out of a backpack and uh but still and, and it's interesting being a nomad or whatever, like just trying to keep yourself like centered, um, you know, like baking the bread, going for walks, making sure I'm drinking enough water, which is like twice as much up at this altitude. Yeah. 
getting, you know, exercising and, and um, just keeping like a balance and maintaining my chi, uh, you know, but also like simple, uh, my life is simplified to this point where I literally, I mean, I have a backpack, I have like, you know, th t like four pairs of socks and underwear. So I go, I got about a week, you know, <laughs> wearing clothes <laughs> or I whatever. Love that, and, yeah. But it's, and it's been really rewarding and free to know like that I can like keep myself centered on so little, you know, and, and, um, yeah. And, and step like not having the cell phone, like anytime I am awake, what, and, which is amazing because there's Wi-Fi everywhere. So when I say I don't have a cell phone, like when I'm in Wi-Fi, I can do all the things that the phone mostly usually does, you know, and including like communicate with people through text or things like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, but when I leave Wi-Fi, like when I traveled overseas, I'm just free. Like I, I'm not, there's no, I'm not going to get like contacted and, and it's just, it's, it's a really like uh, incredible feeling, you know, mm. to know that I can just wander around uh, like on my own accord without being uh, bothered inter by. interrupted. Yeah. Some, some phone calls <laughs> could ruin your day, dude. Yeah. Just yeah. So, uh, now it's just going to be an email that, <laughs> <laughs> and I've really gotten into writing letters. Um, that's nice. I'm, I'm in it. Handwritten letters are, are uh, extinct almost. Right. And it's amazing because you can write a letter, you can put your thoughts on it, and, and it's almost like you hold your convictions to it because then you just you just send it, and mm -hmm. and you don't you and you don't get this immediate response, which I love. Like they read the letter <laughs> and you don't get this fucking text message like immediately, like hey yeah or what. It's just like you yeah. got my message, yeah. you know my feelings, and you know, and then we're good. Get back to me know? whenever you want. Whenever. Dude, there's no rush. You're not leaving me a read. Yeah, yeah, like, totally. Yeah, it's yeah. like they read it. Oh, they're not getting back. Oh shit. Yeah, yeah. That's you beautiful. let you let all that anxiety go, and you just you know in your convictions that you you know uh, invested that energy, and, and you can just like hold on to that. And it's down in the back thirty years, you know. Which yeah, I think our generation is instant everything. Well, technology. If I don't have an AI doing it for me right now. We got to experience what he's talking about as kids and then yeah. we walked into this whole evolution of technology. So we have a taste of it. The kids now, they have no clue. Have no, clue. no clue. But I remember in the 90s growing up, just yeah. like, you know, no when, internet. When, you, when you get to a phone, you check the caller ID or your messages and like, that's yeah. it. There was no anything yeah. past that. It was all playing Someone's outside. Yeah. Yeah. Notes were big back then. They actually. were. Notes were big. Oh my gosh. Even note. In between classes? Here, here. That just reminded <laughs> me of that. Yeah. Like in the sixth grade. Yeah. Like passing notes in between classes. That was that texting, was yes. basically. Yep. Wow. And you got in trouble for it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wow. <laughs> okay. What are some of your best survival techniques out there, dude? Like what's mm. like something you could share with somebody who's maybe traveling a lot and like like I keep a taser with me when I'm I going. I'm actually I got uh uh, bear spray on me right now right now <laughs> yeah and a knife or okay. whatever that i keep always <laughs> okay. I think um, you have a jam pretty quick yeah yeah uh self-reliance by ralph waldo emerson i i'd recommend everyone it's a short essay it's considered one of his best works or whatnot and okay. just like drawing Those are the basic survival skills or well, and when you when you rely on yourself, you have the cumulative force of your an entire lifetime experiences. And anytime you adopt uh, the style of another or whatever, you only have an extemporaneous half possession of it. Wow, you know, so it uh, just like in in cultivating your awareness uh, in in survival, like keeping hydrated. Um, you know, that's a big one. It really is. Cause you never know what's going to happen. And, and you want to be like prepared, like have a core foundation ready for the unknown or unexpected. Um, but one, one thing that has been huge, um, and I was in boy Scouts for like so many years and no one ever told me this. It wasn't until I was working on a weed farm and it was freezing cold. We're out there trying to trim and you couldn't move like 10 feet from the fire. Cause it was just like saying, and, and sleeping at night, you were like shivering. So you can just take a water bottle and, and fill it with hot boiling water Ooh. and throw it in your bag or like anytime you're outside and you're even remotely cold and you're going to be spending any time out there, just get a hot water bottle, put that into your jacket and you'll be toasty warm. Like it's oh. night and day. And it's like if you're sleeping in your car, you know, so or like a little on heater. The, yeah, totally. That's a good one. And, and it stays warm for four to five hours. You got cold water when you wake up 
And you can put two or three of them, like one in the bottom of your bag, one in the top, and you could be in literally, I mean, if you have the right equipment, negative 20, or at least below zero and be fine. Mm-hmm. Like it's a game changer. Wow. If, if I had a van again too, so driving it just, you know, no heat or whatever, and you could just get a warm water bottle and put that on your lap and it's game changer. Mm. So Yeah, that's uh, kind of how people keep greenhouses warm. They have a huge black tank oh. that soaks up the sunlight all day and that oh, wow. water gets really hot. So throughout the night, it's expelling the heat. Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah the same, I mean, it is an incredible, it's been a game changer for me. Or whatnot. Like nice. blowing glass in like a cold environment too, you can do the same. Yeah. And I had many cold nights at Boy Scouts and no one told us that. <laughs> <laughs> what else happened at Boy Scouts, dude? <laughs> All kinds of good stuff. Oh, man. Oh, really? Those were formidable years. Yeah, yeah. Huh. A, lot, we, a lot of camping in the woods, which I think was the beginning of, you know, my getting back to the woods um, and getting back to that, like resurrecting yourself in the wild. Uh, and I, and I had this revelation too, which is in one of those uh, writings where they talk about self-reliance and to be in the woods is to be surrounded by self-reliance because every creature that's out there, every plant or whatever is, is really like has nothing. I mean, there's some symbiosis that's happening, but a lot of it is leaning back on themselves, you know? Mm -hmm. So each one at every frog and, you know, ant and, and chipmunk or whatever is like on their self-reliance. Yeah. And that, and that's, it's a spark. It's inspiring to be out uh, surrounded by that. And, And, in nature too, it really, the longer you spend there and the more time you take, and it, you can just look in the smallest areas and magic is happening, you know, everywhere yeah. around us. It's totally. uh, so yeah, getting reconnected with that has been. Do you take psychedelics out in the woods? I do. And I have a lot and, and I feel like <laughs> with psychedelics, they, uh, you know, if you if you're if I you're, know for a fact he has because about ten years ago with the whip, <laughs> this guy is in the, my backyard of an Airbnb rental, oh my God. cracking an Indiana Jones whip, <laughs> coming out of the bushes. <laughs> I think he was naked too. Oh sure. my God, that was a but, good. But uh, that was almost probably ten years ago. Yeah. So and, you have, but yeah, you do quite yeah. often, and it's a different experience. I mean, well, and I feel like they can really open the door, and then it it makes it it's easier to see, you know, once that door's been open. Mm. And like, so for instance, a couple years back, like I microdosed daily when I was out there in the woods, and it was phenomenal. Like out uh, kayaking by myself down these rivers, and you know, just amazing watching the wind blow through the leaves. But this wow. last year, I had no psychedelics, and I felt equally connected to the wild yeah. when I got out there. Like it, it was just, it, it would catch me. It would like take me. Wow. And th- there was a moment too in in Walden Pond, like uh, Henry David Thoreau talks about. There's times where he was in he was in the door frame, like caught in in a sunbeam, like caught in a revelry until noon. You know, just hours passed, just like captivated by by a moment you know and that and it's like special tranquil experience right you know yeah the first guy that ever gave us mushrooms was like hey look these are really cool but one day you'll learn to get there without taking any of these yeah i don't i haven't taken mushrooms you know but a couple times in the past five years but every time i do it's just like you you know exactly like where it's taking you and then I, I like, you know, the week after, a couple of weeks after, you kind of get these little, little shades of it. And you're like, oh, there it is. But yeah, I'm yeah. completely sober right now. What about that like famous guru who did all this LSD, but he was not affected by it? You know I think story? is that Alan is it, Watts? Is that Alan Watts? Yeah, or like one of his like monks he went to go see or something, yeah. and then that's pretty crazy. How yeah, he just doesn't affect him because he's on. He's there. A different level. Already. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's wild. I think this year alone, you know, really, I, I felt like I was, I was definitely connected. Having less distraction and, and really like finding your own, your own path, carving out your own, your own path, you know, finding your own heartbeat, you know, or whatever. What about any kind of meditation or breathing exercises while you're out in the wild? I need to, I need to lean into that. Yeah. <laughs> so check out Wim Hof. I, you know, Mm. I just read about that and it's funny, you know, how Mm -hmm. when you hear about something and it comes up a lot and Mm -hmm. blew my mind, I'm just like, what? Yeah. 
I've held my breath for almost three minutes. Doing really? Off. Uh, so I used to do that technique when I was a kid. Uh, we had a membership to the health club and I would hyperventilate and then hold my breath all by myself in the corner of the pool, timing myself. Mm -hmm. Just And I've also jumped in really cold water quite a bit. And that's an invigorating experience. I did that on my birthday this year. At 6 a.m. in the morning, we went into the creek. And we no had a way. cold plunge for three minutes, heart underneath water. Mm. For three in minutes? Three minutes, my first time. Wow. There's video of it. Yeah. Damn. It was uh, exhillarating. Oh, and my God. it was like, I want to do it again. Wow. Awesome. Okay. Well, then yeah, we're going we to have to do that together. Okay. We'll set that up. That's a challenge, though, dude. Three yeah. minutes. Three minutes. Wow. Timed it. Just breathing, keeping my shoulders down because they wanted to go up to here. Oh, and the, I've done a lot of in and out. I have not done anything close to three minutes. Yeah. That sounds like a lifetime right now, dude. I'm impressed. It was, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you. I guess your body thinks it's dying and then it recovers That's, really well. And like yeah. it's for cell recovery and like. I mean, the healing properties of doing that are insane. Yeah. And I felt it right away. And then it was like, got into the car and I was fine, dude. You well, know, I and I've it. noticed in yoga too, where you're stretching and twisting and warming up parts of the body that have been stagnant. And I feel like with this technique on the opposite end of the spectrum, you're just electrifying. Like every cell is squeezing, it's moving some things around. Your whole body is just energized. Like, and, and the, yeah. I, I guess you get a rush of adrenaline mm -hmm. and other- All of healing. it, dude. Yeah. And the winter, they, they hack through the ice because it freezes over and yes. then they make a little hole and they go in there. And, and I've done that, it. like a polar plunge, but we it literally were in and out. It, it's remarkable how your instincts kick in. Like the second you get in, you're, it's rocket. You, you're just out of the water. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Gotta stay for three minutes. Dude. That's that's I'm gonna, that's a challenge right there. Yeah, so definitely check out the Wim Hof because that is just like mad rest of adrenaline. Yeah. Which is just really good for your body. Well, and breathing too. I mean, it, it's just the basic. I mean, we're doing this every second of our life. Oxygen, it's so important in having a good breathing. And I don't. Like, I, I know I breathe shallow and or whatever. But And I've been spending more time drinking water and stretching. And, and I, I feel like I do meditate, but I don't necessarily do the, you know, maybe it's a moving meditation or whatever it is. But... I've noticed the value more of having a quiet mind because I've been meditating the last four days in a row. Wow. Some, yeah. For 10 minutes, like a day morning. But this meditation is great. I used to be on like a huge kick and I kind of lost it for a little bit. And then just the last four days every day I've been doing it and it's good. Like I need it. And today's 10 minutes went by in like two minutes. Wow. It felt like first day I was like checking. I'm like, oh my God, I got two minutes left. Felt like an eternity. Wow. But, right, right, right. Yeah. So it's good. It's good mental. I love it. I think it is. I have I mean, my own little techniques, but. Even like when that, I was uh, talking about earlier, like when that wave kind of crashed over me, the complications with the trailer and I kind of went off social media, like I, my mind was plagued with like dark thoughts and, and I would just recycle that shit in my head and it, and it became like kind of a problem. And, and I, that's when I realized like the value of meditation to be able to like quiet your mind. Cause these thoughts aren't doing anything for you mm. to a degree, you know, or whatever, like anxiety or trauma or whatever, you know, I would just like cycle this situation through my head. And instead of focusing on how to alleviate or fix it, you know, I was just like mulling over the end, yeah, but it, your it, brain's a muscle dude. you got to work it out and it gets easier and then you right. create new neuro pathways, you know, yeah. the more you think about it, you create matter with thought because you think about something enough, yep. it actually creates little pathways, pathways in your head. You could dissect out. I think you, Thoreau talked about they, cause he talks about walking in the woods and it, you walk over and over and you stamp out a path mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. And the same thing, like you're saying happens with your thoughts. And I experienced that on that opposite end of the spectrum where I kind of woke myself up and was like, I need to like change these mental patterns that I've been like falling into for so long. Yeah. And whatnot. You got that lighter by any chance, brother? Oh, thank Bam. you. <laughs> Well, I think this was a great episode. I think we covered a lot, man. Do you got any yeah. upcoming plans or anything you'd like to shout out? Everything is so up in the air right now. So it, uh, yeah, I don't really have, I'm just kind of really living in the moment. And then that, that's beautiful. Yeah. So I was going to say, do you have a message for the people? Anyone listening, anybody, you know, maybe on the same similar path? You, Believe in or, your dreams. It's funny. That's something that I wrote a long time ago. Believe and, in your dreams. Yeah. And, and it's really coming back to me, you know, that uh, just follow your heart, uh, follow your creative energy. 
cultivate creative energy, even if you don't consider yourself a creative person or whatever. I feel like it's really important to have something go. And yeah, go for walks. Um, That's I, big time, yeah. Yeah, Just walks are walk. so easy and, and a lot of magic can happen. And maybe listen to something while you're walking, but also try to like not be distracted, you know, like don't take the cell phone, no Pokemon go or anything like that, you know, just like go for the walk for the sheer, like smell the roses, listen to the birds. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, uh, that is a a good thing. Yeah, that is. I'm sure there's an app for that too. (laughs) Yeah. yeah, yeah. Go for a walk. (laughs) Tell you, tell you a certain amount. Yeah, no, that's been something that, uh, just making sure that I do, uh, like three to five mile walk daily is, is had a huge impact is like making the time for that. But yeah, yeah that's nice. a lot of great input, man. Yeah. I, it's yeah, inspiring. I can't thank you guys Actually. enough. This has been so incredible to be here in this, this like professional environment, getting all the equipment set up and the yeah. having well, such nice equipment. Happy to, to have you and lucky to have you since you don't have a cell phone. We had to like I'm, make notes actually. Yeah. We did make notes for this. And, and you know, that, down. that yeah. was such in the moment too. I walked by, oh. you saw me through the window. It's like, bang, bang, bang. Called me in, <laughs> pitched the, the idea of this. And then, you know, and we set it in our calendar and yeah, it's, we it's went a, old school on that. We didn't like, yeah, no yeah. We did, there were no texting, no emails got sent back and forth. That was good. It was whispers in the wind. And we made it happen. Yes, we did. Yeah. yeah. It's well, been neat to, uh, I, you know, it's been challenging. I didn't necessarily think I was going to be out of the woods. I kind of imagined I'd still be back there. That's when I dropped the cell phone because I was outside of cell phone range anyway. And then things, you know, like kind of life threw me some curveballs. And But it's been exciting to, like you can uh, Google Maps, you can download maps offline so like when I showed up in Florida, I just, you know, did a stretch and downloaded that map and then my maps worked. I could still look places yeah. up and get directions yeah, you or whatnot. Them. That's a great tip. Cause sometimes you just get out of service and you're like, oh fuck, how do I get home? Right. I've yeah. done that. But for everyone with cell phones out there, mm. they'll be able to capture this, uh, this new podcast yeah. on robertsonglassart.com. So we'll be posting that up here soon but again i just want to thank you for coming through dude i think we did a great episode today i love it it's been a pleasure yeah i think it's great too that you're putting these up on your uh website i really like that that yeah and then we're going to put it on spotify after we go through the whole season yeah yeah that's great to draw uh, draw in like use your website you know as like the force of your it's been a lot it's been a struggle like even today i had to like be on the phone with my internet provider because I need like triple the service for like <laughs> one video. It's just nuts, dude. Drives wow. me nuts. But I want. I think I'm gonna go take a walk in the woods after this. <laughs> show. I think that's some great advice. Yeah, yeah. Just to let your mind stretch out for a minute, and then you can really come back with like a refreshed. Yeah, um, uh, that's energy. a healthy thing. I do that all the time. Yeah. Last time I went to go for a walk, I got rear-ended right when I was turning into the parking lot. Oh, no. Yeah, that was like, <laughs> seriously, so I got oh, rear-ended, dude. Oh. I needed to go for a walk that day. I'm like, oh, there it is. And this lady slammed into me. Yeah. So, but today is a great day. And thank you for coming through, man. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, let's yeah. sign off, I guess. I mean, I'm Matt. I'm Sean. <laughs> Doge World, Gypsy Renaissance Warrior. Hell yeah. Oh. Thanks for tuning in, guys. We'll see you next time on the Robertson Stash. Oh.